Thanks, Rob. I really appreciate that. And thank you, IDEA, for the uh, honor of getting to do this. Um, what I'm hoping to do is really talk to you about the arc of history of uh, energy at the Princeton University and use that not so much as an example of what you should do, but an example of the good thought process. I really stand on the shoulders of about 25 generations of engineers who've, who've had uh, my seat at the university. And I'd like to highlight some of the uh, decision-making process that ma they made over the years. So now we'll hop in our Wayback Machine. We'll hop in the uh, time machine and zip all the way back to 1754. And there's a neat story back in 1754. Uh, the Fitzrandolph family was standing at the top of this hillside. Uh, the drawing was done in 1876, so this is, this is more than 100 years later. But you can picture the hillside originally just had trees and it just had farmed fields off in the distance is what they were looking at. Uh, and maybe one or two buildings at the top of the hill. And they decided that they would raise uh, 2,000 pounds. So they raised 2,000 pounds financially, and they offered a gift to the university of about four and a half acres. And then at the bottom of this deed, at the bottom of the, uh, the, the, the gift, there's a little asterisk that said basically, and 200 acres of woodland for fuel. That's what we're doing. That's our job today. That, that concept, back in 1754, they understood that if you're going to have buildings, if you're going to build a place for people to study and to teach, they need to be comfortable. They need to be warm. They need to be well lit. And so they needed firewood at that point. Our jobs right now are a, a direct continuation of that thought. We've refined it a little bit. We're a little bit more efficient. But essentially, we're doing the exact same thing. So we'll fast forward now to 1876. This is our Dickinson building, and this was the very first district, uh, the house, if you want, for the very first district energy on campus. So in 1876, they had boilers in the basement of this building, and they began to branch out to what then was about a couple dozen or a dozen uh, buildings on campus with their steam system. So in 1876, we began the, uh, the district energy on campus. Uh, we continue a few years later, and they decided that they needed a separate and a distinct building for um, the energy plant. So you see in the center with the, uh, with the chimney what they called the new dynamo building. So in the new dynamo building, uh, they produced steam. They pushed it through a back pressure steam turbine. What a novel idea. We're doing that today. Uh, they pushed it through a back pressure steam turbine, and they made electricity uh, by spinning the uh, generator, and the steam went out to the campus. 1880, the first CHP on campus. A few years later, um, this is a picture of uh, Dr. Joseph Henry. He was doing research uh, in his uh, medical laboratory. And Joseph Henry is lucky to have a statue to him. In fact, uh, frankly, he owes a debt of gratitude to the brilliant people in the facilities department. He was using ether for anesthetization in his laboratory. And there were gas lights all around the, uh, the, the room. And, and I hear a few chuckles. Basically, these ga uh, people know that if your car won't start on a really cold winter day, what do you do? You spray a little bit of ether in the intake manifold, and things go boom in a hurry. Uh, Dr. Henry is very lucky that things didn't go boom when he was using ether in the same room with gas lights. But what they did in the 1880s, uh, the, the guys in the facilities department said, well, why don't we take advantage of this really cool new technology they're working, down in, working on down in Philly? Let's bring electric lights up here. And this new innovation into the laboratory and made it safer more reliable, and again, better lighting. A few years later, the campus had expanded and continued to expand and continue to expand. Um, and so we built a new boiler house in 1924. Again, uh, there was a, a great national infrastructure for delivering coal. So the, coal, the uh, plant was a coal-fired uh, power plant. Little changed all the way from the 1920s to the 19, uh, 1959. These gentlemen standing here would still have been delivering coal to those same boilers in 1959. We fast forward a little bit to 1964, and you can see those burner, burner fronts are now modified to accept natural gas. We got rid of the coal because the natural gas infrastructure nationally had been um, broadened out to the point. And the, the university uh, facilities department said, well, what's the opportunity? Uh, well, we can get uh, cleaner fuel. We can get a safer. Uh, or a healthier environment for the campus, and we can add reliability.
because we don't have the, uh, the rail infrastructure that could be interrupted. So they converted to gas in the uh, 1960s. Now we'll hop in our time machine and we'll kind of zip backwards in time a little bit. Uh, this is Willis Haviland Carrier, who graduated from Cornell. Nice job, guys. Uh, and in 1902, he first demonstrated his, his air conditioner. Uh, and in 1902, uh, at that time, if you had wanted to cool off uh, the cheese from your farm or the milk that you bought, uh, you would have harvested, if you wanted a ton of cooling, you would have harvested 2,000 pounds of ice from the pond and then stored that and used that in your ice box, as these people were demonstrating a couple years ago. Uh, interestingly, the very first equipment that we used for our chilled water plant that was built in 1962, was produced by Mr. Carrier's company. And one of the most visionary decisions I think that they made in the facilities department was, what is our opportunity? What are we good at? Well, we're really good at making steam. We've been doing this for 100 years by that point. And we have all this infrastructure, but it basically sits idle during the summer. How can we take advantage of that? So all the equipment that was in the new chilled water plant was steam-driven equipment from the Carrier Corporation and it stands today. We fast forward again to the 1990s, and we built a cogeneration plant. What's the opportunity? How can we take advantage of it? Well, at that point, the spark spread, the difference between uh, buying gas and producing your own uh, electricity versus buying electricity for the university uh, was very attractive, and we were able to justify the, the construction of a new cogeneration plant. That also, as Tom mentioned earlier, Tom Nyquist mentioned earlier, uh, gave us much more self-sufficiency and much more reliability. Prior to this plant, almost everything was pneumatic controls. And it was only in the uh, mid-90s when we upgraded to uh, fully uh, digital controls and much, much more automation. And we've continued to step in that direction now. <clears throat> in 2005, we added thermal storage. And again, this was more of an economic play. How do we take advantage of a market that instead of being a flat rate of electricity, is now a very volatile rate of electricity that changes uh, truly every five minutes. The price of electricity changes now in an unregulated market. So now what I'd like to do is focus on a few very specific projects that I think, again, are instructive of the thought process behind the decisions that we were making. We uh, implemented the IceTech system. This is a system that advises us in real time how do we use all the equipment in our plant. Is this, Almost all of us have very, very similar systems in terms of the equipment that's there. I think what differentiates us is that we're dispatching this equipment on a predictive basis in real time. So we'll predict ahead 24 hours and figure out what will we operate at any given time. And then if the market changes, we will, ch we will react to that market. So we switch from a predictive mode to a reactive mode. How does solar fit into this stuff? How does solar fit with the district energy and how, does it, how well does it work? And what I'd suggest is it works absolutely beautifully. Um, what you can see is a 24-hour pe uh, period showing the electric production and the electric purchase uh, back in August. The, the dark blue at the bottom shows how much we're generating with the uh, co-generation set. So in the middle of the night, uh, uh, you can see that we're making about seven megawatts. The purple on top of that is the power that we're buying at that same substation. The green at the very top is power that we're buying at a different substation on campus. And the red is the solar energy that we're uh, generating, again, at that second substation on campus. So look what happens. In the middle of the night, prices for, price for, of electricity is low. So we generate a little bit, but we keep running for reliability. and then. We're buying a bunch of power from the utility. You can see an upward rectangle, and that's really us charging our thermal storage tank when prices are cheap, and then discharging the thermal storage uh, tank later in the day at the peak. So we're, mo we're phase shifting in time our purchase of electricity. The price of power may come up uh, roughly 9 AM, and you can see the purple stops. We stop buying electricity, and we increase the amount that we're generating. And very, uh, a very sweet combination of, of timing is that the solar electric comes on uh, just as the sun comes up. And it minimizes the amount of power that we're purchasing on the uh, second substation. 
So the net result is absolutely a beautiful graph. Uh, you can see that the price of power in red goes up and down during the day, and the amount we're purchasing goes down and up during the day. So we buy the most when power is cheap, and we avoid the purchase of power when it's most expensive. This is what everybody else does. Everybody else buys very little power when power is inexpensive, and everybody else buys the most they possibly can when, when power prices are highest. So again, we've layered cogeneration and thermal storage and this economic dispatch and solar on top of each other to end up with basically doing the opposite of what everybody else on the entire grid does, or almost everybody else on the grid does. What else have we added? Over time, we've uh, figured out how we can steal uh, BTUs that were originally going up the stack of the cogen system and dump them back into the uh, incoming feed water or the returning condensate. Uh, we basically tripled the economizer surface area, and we added a condensing heat exchanger, so we're actually extracting some of the uh, latent and the sensible heat from the exhaust uh, of the cogeneration system. Where's the waste? Where's the opportunity? Well, the waste in this case was a little bit of noise and a little bit of heat going through the control valves in our steam distribution system. We were running 200 PSI to distribute steam around the campus, and then we dropped down to 15 PSI for safety in the buildings. We've had uh, control valves there for years, very typical. And what we did is we installed little back pressure steam turbines in parallel with those control valves, and they come on first, and they can make a half a megawatt. They can make uh, enough steam, uh, enough power for six to 12 dormitories. That's non-trivial. That's pretty nice. That was with energy that was essentially being wasted before we put this in. What's the opportunity? Well, biodiesel was a neat opportunity. We actually uh, were the first in the state to burn biodiesel uh, in our stationary boilers, and we were the first ones in the world to burn biodiesel in our particular model gas turbine. If we burn biodiesel in a central plant on a district energy system, by making one small physical change in the plant, we can reduce the carbon footprint for 180 buildings. That's a pretty sweet combination. What's the opportunity and how can we take advantage of it? The opportunity is a lot of renewable energy has been added. I think Juan Ontiveros mentioned that um, the solar and the wind, as nice as they are, they're gifts. You need to accept them when they're given, and they don't always come when you want them. So you need to find something else to fill in the, the uh, peaks and the valleys. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission recognized that they needed somebody to help fill in the peaks and the valleys of both the voltage and the uh, frequency on the entire grid. And so uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission Rule 755 and uh, 745 both motivate people, provide economic motivation to people who are able to help support the grid, help support voltage and frequency. So if you're highly responsive, down to maybe the five second or one second time frame, you can actually participate in a very lucrative market. By taking advantage of the investment that we had in CHP, and specifically on-site generation, we're able to earn a few hundred thousand dollars a year in addition with no extra capital investment. That's a pretty good payback. We just need to be very market sensitive and able to uh, respond very quickly. I want to recognize some of the people that I've learned from, or more importantly, the uh, systems that I've learned from, and acknowledge that there are many people here in the room that, that each of us can learn from. Cornell found that they could reject the heat of the entire campus to Lake Cayuga. There's trillions of gallons of water in Lake Cayuga. The solar heat gain on Lake Cayuga is way, way more than the amount of energy that the entire university needs to reject. So they're making essentially a, a, a trivial um, heat input to the lake, but they're rejecting all the heat from the entire university with no compression cooling and with no cooling towers. That's admirable. They've also uh, made the conversion from a coal-fired heating plant to a natural gas uh, CHP plant. My friend's up in Boston. Um, MIT is extending from their steam system out with a hot water system. Um, Harvard is using, and Harvard and Radcliffe and a few others are making very extensive use of ground, of, uh, ground source heat pumps. In Stanford, I believe, they're also making a tricky combination of these two ideas, and I think this is really the golden ideal. They're finding ways to take heat from the returning chilled water and actually using it elsewhere on campus in a productive way in their hot water system. University of Toronto, they're celebrating more than 100 years of district energy. 
Uh, they're the ones who taught us how to take the heat uh, from the uh, exhaust of a cogeneration plant and dump it back into the returning condensate. They're, they were several years ahead of us with the uh, SOFAME project. Down in Texas, uh, UT Austin, I used to kind of joke, well, you know, they could supply all of ERCOT if it went dark. I talked to Juan the other day, and in fact, they have 130 some megawatts. He truly is in a position to be able to bootstrap if the entire state of Texas went dark. He is in a position to bootstrap the state of Texas and get them restarted and get the, get the lights going. Uh, he also has very reliable steam, very reliable chilled water because of the way they set up their system. These guys, you, Missouri, and Columbia can basically burn anything that, that stands still for a minute. Uh, they can burn, <laughs> <laughs> they found ways to burn corn, biomass, ag waste. They can burn uh, mill products, uh, and they can throw tires in there and they can make useful energy with it. So not only are they making productive use of waste, but they're also avoiding landfills. Same kind of story with Seattle Steam. Uh, I want to point out that it doesn't have to be an institutional environment. It doesn't have to be a not-for-profit uh, environment. Seattle Steam has found ways to take uh, woody, bio, uh, woody biomass or urban wood waste, think about pallets being chipped up, thrown into a uh, furnace, burnt, and they're making useful, productive uh, energy out of that, they are supplying 200 buildings. They have cut the carbon footprint of 200 buildings in half or better. Uh, that's pretty impressive. Atlantic City, New York City, Philadelphia, uh, Chicago all have district energy systems. These are for-profit systems and they are reducing the carbon footprint and reducing the total energy spend for, for their, uh, their cities. We're going to focus back on Princeton for a moment. Our sustainability program is that we will get from uh, present levels back to 1990 levels by year 2020, or present levels of CO2 back to 1990 by 2020. We originally thought this would be a really stiff push-up. We thought this was going to be pretty hard to, to meet these. Uh, that was maybe six years ago. At this point, I can say we're fully confident we're going to get there. We have 95% fully defined. Uh, many of these projects have already been implemented. Some of these projects are still in progress, we're in the engineering stage, but we know how we're going to get there. And at this point, it doesn't look all that hard. Um, we've done project after project after project. Uh, we are not normalizing per square feet. We're not normalizing for the number of people on campus. This is sort of the acid test. As the campus has grown a couple million square feet, we have actually, in real terms, reduced our carbon footprint very significantly. That's the easy part. Now, if you accept the, uh, the, the wisdom of the, uh, today's na uh, global climate scientists, as I do, uh, ultimately, we need to get somewhere around 80% below uh, current CO2 levels if we're going to stave off uh, the effects of global warming. That's going to take a complete rethink of all the way we treat and the way we talk about energy uh, in, in the country and in the world. We are the people who are going to do that. Really, we are the ones who need to teach everybody else how we're going to get there. Let's talk about reliability. Uh, Rob mentioned this a little while ago, but Princeton was literally the bright spot uh, in the state when Hurricane uh, Sandy came through. We were able to power the campus for several days when everything else was dark. We were able to open our doors and actually offer space for other people if they needed to come in and get warm, uh, recharge their cell phones so that they could literally just communicate with, with one another. This didn't happen accidentally. It took years of planning. Uh, it certainly took some luck but it also took a lot of people working very hard to get to, get to that point. We're very fortunate to have on-site generation. It was really obvious that the light stayed on. What wasn't obvious is the steam stayed on, the chilled water stayed on. If you're a researcher and you've got 10 years worth of glacial ice that happens to be stored in a freezer someplace, and that freezer rejects heat to the uh, chilled water system, you'd really like that to stay working. No problems with that. If you have the 17th generation of small animal or the, the, the 57th generation of little fly that you're studying and it needs to be very carefully climate controlled and you need the steam on, that matters. So the researchers care very deeply about the reliability of not just the electricity but the steam and the chilled water. A couple things that I'd like to share in maybe 25 years worth of experience in this game and, and, and many of you guys know these ideas but you should seek the highest and best use and the lowest grade energy that's required for every, th for every uh, time you touch energy, seek the highest and best use for it. 
And when you're designing a system, design a system that uses the lowest possible grade of energy. That gives you much more opportunity to use things like um, solar thermal or ground source heat pumps. There are no one-dimensional decisions. Everything you're gonna do affects somebody's lifestyle. It affects somebody's aesthetics. It affects uh, the institution that you're working for. Everything you do, to do it right, it's all in the details, okay? You can't write a single check and solve the carbon problem. You can't do one single problem that's gonna move the in entire, ins you can't solve one single problem that will move the entire institution to a better financial spot or a better uh, carbon position. You need to figure out exactly situation specific, uh, institution specific what the right solution is. Something that works for you may not work for your next door neighbor, the exact same solution because they have a different uh, funding model or they have a different time horizon. I'd suggest that all of our work is stewardship. Everything that we do is either financial stewardship or environmental stewardship and you need to think about it that way. District money, uh, district energy takes time, it takes money, therefore it's going to take vision, it's going to take passion, and it's going to take champions. None of the projects that you heard about earlier today um, were done overnight. They took years worth of thinking, years to implement, and they will last for years. We as a group need to take more of a leadership role. Uh, we need to be the explainers, we need to be the teachers, um, and I would suggest that one of the things that you need to not only be passionate about, but evangelical about, is life cycle cost analysis. You need to be able to talk to people and say, don't think about now, don't think about tripping over your shoes, think about the longest time horizon you can possibly imagine, and then you'll get, you'll understand what the right decision is. Everything breaks, you should plan on it. Do your design on the basis that whatever you're putting in today, needs to come out, it needs to be re repaired, it will eventually need to be replaced. If you take that, the life cycle concept uh, to its fullest, you'll get the best design. If that sounds pessimistic, you should also anticipate collateral benefits. When you put in the VFD, you sought energy savings, and so the motor, the motor also, uh, the benefit was that the motor ran quietly. When you fix the steam leak, you sought energy savings, but it also meant that the guy upstairs was much uh, more comfortable and his office was quieter. You should also think in terms of continuous improvements. Uh, I do a project and it takes me sometimes 18 months of staring at that project when it's complete to realize what the next project is. But essentially today's project will reveal tomorrow's opportunity. The last thing I'm gonna challenge you with is you need to take this personally. You can't just do this at work. You can't just say, oh, well, I do energy for a job. No, I live this stuff. Uh, you need to live this stuff. And I'm gonna put this out here. I will challenge you. One year from now, I'm gonna ask you personally, what is your carbon footprint? How many tons of CO2 are you and your family responsible for every year? What is your total energy spend? How much do you personally spend on energy at your house in one year, these are my numbers. Two years from now, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna ask you, what did you do to change that? Um, in my case, I was able to cut the energy spend in half. I was able to cut the carbon footprint by at least 60%. You can do that, um, and I'd be happy to tell you how in the hallway. The uh, pessimist says the glass is half half empty, the optimist says the glass is half full, the engineer says the glass is too big. Where's the waste? What's the opportunity? So let's look, what's on the desk today? What, the, this is uh, a very messy desk, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll say what are we looking at in our department right now at, at, at Princeton? Um, we are looking at passive or near zero energy buildings to the extent we can. We're reducing uh, the amount of energy that each existing building takes and wherever we can, we're building the uh, tightest buildings that we can. We're looking at fuel cells. I particularly like ones where I can recover the heat as well as produce electricity. We do have a value for heat, uh, so we'd like, we'd like both the BTUs as well as the KWHs. Uh, we're certainly looking at additional places where we can use renewable energy on campus. Uh, we're looking at ground source heat pumps. We have uh, several uh, different locations that we're considering. We have an apartment complex and another one that's being built 
Uh, we have an arts district that's also going to be on ground source heat pumps. Um, I'd love long term to be talking about a uh, hot water loop. We're tightening up buildings. Uh, as you know, we're in the biofuels market. We're thinking about our trash. Where's the waste? Where's the opportunity? Could I make kilowatt hours out of that? Could I uh, extract BTUs out of that so that it's not leaving the campus at all? And long term, we're thinking about water reduction. Uh, the whole conversation about energy is completely intertied with uh, the conversation about water. And I expect a few years from now, we're going to be talking more about that on, uh, at these conferences. District energy, most of you don't need to be sold on. It centralizes everything that breaks. It centralizes the tools. It centralizes uh, the emissions. It centralizes uh, the fuel deliveries. If I had uh, 300 buildings that I needed to serve, rather than 300 boilers, now I can serve it with three boilers. Uh, same thing, if I had, rather than 300 cooling towers, I could have uh, one set of cooling towers. So all the people are in one spot, the problems are in one spot, and the opportunity to solve those problems are in one spot. I have a higher initial cost, often, but not always, but I have a much, much better life cycle cost and a much lower carbon footprint. Here's the takeaway. Start wherever you are. If you have separate buildings, begin to interconnect them. Tighten up the worst ones first, and then use the savings to pay for the next steps, just as Bob was suggesting earlier. As you build a new system, what are the opportunities in that location? What can I imagine out of the very farthest time horizon? And if you have a mature system, look for the waste and let that inform you what your next job is. Thank you very much.